Track 2. Good morning. Hello. Could you help me with some travel information, please? Of course. What do you want to know? Well, I need to get to Harrogate. I'm starting a course there this month and I'm wondering how I can get there. OK, that shouldn't be a problem. What's the name of the place again? Harrogate. Shall I spell that? Yes, please. H A R R O G A T E. Thank you. And that's in Yorkshire? That's right. When would you like to travel? Well, next week sometime, I suppose. But the thing I'm wondering about right now is how to get there, how long it takes, and that sort of thing. OK. Well, basically, there are two main ways of getting there by bus or by train. There are direct buses, and there are plenty of trains, but you have to change. That sounds complicated. Not really. You have to change just once. There are trains via York or Leeds, so you can go via either one. You mean I can change in York or. Or Leeds, yes. It doesn't really make any difference. But the bus is direct, so it's quicker, right? No, I'm afraid not. The bus stops three times en route, so it takes longer. How much difference is there? It varies depending on what time you travel and how much you pay, but it'll be at least a couple of hours slower by coach. I see. Track three. So let's say I travel next week. How much will it cost? Which day? Oh, Tuesday or maybe Thursday. Say Thursday. What time? After lunch, about two maybe. Going by bus or train? Well, can you give me details for both? Okay. And do you want a return ticket? Ah,、uh, I think just one way, please, for now. There's a train leaving London at two thirty, getting into Harrogate. Two hours forty-five minutes later. How about on the bus? Let's see. There's one at two o'clock from Victoria Coach Station. It takes six hours thirty-five minutes. Track four. How much is the cheapest ticket by train? Have you got a rail card? A what? Sorry. A young traveller's rail card. It gives you a twenty-five percent discount on rail tickets. You can buy one if you're under twenty-six. No, I haven't. Okay, well, the cheapest rail ticket is sixteen pounds fifty. That's without a rail card. And how much is a rail card? It's twenty pounds. Hmm, it doesn't seem worth it. Does the bus company have a cheaper ticket? Well, the standard fare is eighteen pounds seventy-five, but the bus company has a student discount card, so that's fifteen pounds if you have a card. And how much is the card? It costs ten pounds. It lasts a year and gets you twenty percent off all your coach tickets. That sounds pretty good, but then the journey takes so much longer on the bus, doesn't it? Yes, it's six and a half hours on the bus. I think I'll take the train after all. What time does it leave exactly? At two thirty. That's fine. Can you give me a ticket for that? Of course. I'll need to book you a seat. Track five. B C. D, E, G, P, T, V, A, H, J, K, F, L, M, N, S, X, Z, I, Y, O, R. Q U W. Track six. One. O eight seven O. Two two five two two five. Two. Six point five. Three. Six point seven five. Four. Six and a half. Five. Nine twenty p.m. Six. Nine forty-five a.m. Seven. Slash. Eight. At. Nine. Dot. Track seven. One. Two men from Northern Ireland won the Nobel Prize for Peace. In 1998, two. 
Fidel Castro was born August 13th. 3. A return ticket to Paris from London costs 40 pounds 14 pence. 4. It takes two and a half hours to fly from London to Rome. 5. It is 97 miles from New York to Philadelphia. 6. James Cook landed in Australia in 1770. 7. The time difference between London and Shanghai is seven hours. 8. The 2004 Olympic Games were held in Athens. Track 8. 1. There's a train leaving London Euston, that's E U S T O N, at 2.30. 2. There's one at 2 o'clock from Victoria Coach Station. 3. The postcode is HG21JL. 4. The surname is Favell. That's F A U V E L L. 5. I've got an offer from Birmingham University. 6. OK, that's, let's see, 124 Warwick Road. That's W-A-R-W-I-C-K Road. 7. The postcode is PB7-9RL. 8. It arrives in Manchester at 1641. Track 9. Welfare office, good morning. How can I help you? Um, I think I need to see a dentist. Oh dear, are you in a lot of pain? Well, I, I chipped my tooth on a bottle last night and it really hurts. Oh, I'm sorry. Whereabouts do you live? So I can give you the name of a dentist near you. In Harborne. OK. There's a dentist just off the high street there. That's Mr J Daunt and Associates. Sorry, could you spell that, please? Yes, that's... D-A-U-N-T. Daunt. OK. Um, do you think I'll be able to see him today? Well, dentists tend to be very busy. You'd have to call them and see. I'll give you the phone number. It's 429-6241. 429 Thanks. And uh, do you have the address? The address is... 59 Rattlebarn Road. That's R A double D L E B A R N Road. Is there any way to see a dentist quickly? Well, if you explain it's a real emergency, he'll probably see you quite quickly. Why don't you call and see what they say? Yes, I think I will. Thank you very much for your help. Track 10. Mr. Daunt's surgery, good morning. Oh, hello. I'm calling to ask if the dentist can see me today. I chipped a front tooth last night and it's really painful. Oh, I see. Um, well, in that case, let me see if I can fit in an emergency appointment for you. Um, how about 5.30 this afternoon? Oh, yes, thank you. Can I have your name, please? Yes, my name's David Sang, uh, Z-H-A-N-G. Z-H-A-N-G. Thank you. And can you tell me how much it's going to cost? Well, it depends on how much work Mr Daunt has to do. An emergency appointment is £60. Oh, uh, that is expensive. Don't you have a discount for students? Yes, we do. We can give you a 20% discount on the emergency appointment, so it'll be £48. After that, we recommend you join our insurance scheme. The normal price is £20 a month. Students pay £15 a month over the year. £15? That's much more than I can afford. We also offer a discount of 15% for students on regular checkups. Oh, what's the normal price then? 
A regular checkup usually costs forty-five pounds. Would you like to come and see Mr. Daunt and see what he says? Yes, I think I'd better. My tooth is really hurting. That's fine. See you at five thirty. Section two, track eleven. Good afternoon. My name is Terry Cole, and I'd like to welcome you all to this induction session. Uh, what I'd like to do this afternoon is to try to give you a brief idea of how the university works, and what sort of facilities and opportunities there are here for you. So, uh, if I could start by talking about the way the university is structured, unlike most universities in this country, we're not a campus university. This means the university is spread throughout the town. And there's no one place where you can say it's located.、Uh, all of you, of course, belong to a college, and your college is the place where you live. In fact, the university is really an association of all the colleges.、Uh, they work together to provide your university education. This means that any kind of questions you may have about accommodation, your room, your meals, your washing, these should be taken up with your college. Your director of studies—that's the person responsible for all your courses—is also based in your college, and you should go to them for any questions you may have about your work, as they are responsible for your academic life. So the college is the foundation of your life here, your social as well as your academic life.、Uh, but in addition, the university has faculties: the history faculty. Science faculties and engineering faculty. The faculties are responsible for the academic organisation of the university. Lecturers from all the colleges work together in the faculties to plan and teach the programmes of studies. The faculties also organise all the examinations. Your college has a library, but you may find that your faculty library has a larger selection of books available. And is more useful for most of your courses. Of course, there's also the university library, which has the most extensive range of books, which you may want to use sometimes. There aren't any sports facilities in the colleges. For those of you who are interested in sports, there is more information about the sports centre on the university website. Track twelve. Now, of course,、uh, one of the main things you need to do in these first few days is to find your way around. <laughs> so let's take a look at some of the local landmarks, some of the most obvious and most useful places on the map. So, starting in the town centre, that's towards the bottom of the map, and going out west along Lensman Road, you'll find there are quite a lot of good, inexpensive places to eat along here. But before those, you come to some of the main university buildings. First, the museum on your right. It's a beautiful old Victorian building. Then, on the same side of the road, just after the museum, you'll come across a large glass-built construction surrounded by fountains. That's the students' union. You can't miss it. Then, just beyond it, along the footpath, is the science faculty. Heading out to the east, along James Street, you'll find the university library on the left, and just opposite the engineering faculty. But if you're looking for shops, banks, and supermarkets, you need to be in the town centre. There are lots of narrow streets, and、uh, it's easy to get lost. If you go north from the town centre. Out along John Street, you come first to John's College on the left, and just across the road, one of the main supermarkets. You could almost call it the University Supermarket because it's used so much by students. The prices are very competitive.、Uh, across the river on the left is the Castle, and opposite the Castle, there's the Sports Centre. If you go a little further on, across Ripley Road, you'll come to the Swimming Pool. So that's a brief tour. We can't show you everything there is in town, and at this stage, that will probably be pretty confusing anyway.、Uh, are there any questions? 
Track 13. Hi, I'm Jenny Parkside. I'm the president of your local students' union here at the university, and I'm going to tell you about some of the great things we do in the union. First of all, the union is the centre of student social life. As you've seen, we have a brand new union building in Lensman Road. There are three dining rooms and two bars open seven days a week, which serve food at very reasonable prices. So if you don't feel like paying high prices for your meals in town, you can always eat at the Union. During the week, we have stand up comedy shows and live entertainment in the bars. And at weekends, there are all night live bands at the nightclub. We run a huge range of clubs and activities for everyone, including sports clubs. Um, rowing, golf, tennis, badminton, you name it. Our members take part in all kinds of fundraising activities for charity, and we have countless associations that support activities from filmmaking to mountain climbing. Now, I'll tell you a little about the more formal functions of the union. First and foremost, we represent your interests across the board social, financial, educational, and cultural. As an executive, we have the job of negotiating issues on your behalf that may affect you as a student. It's our job to consult with you and raise your concerns at university committee meetings, including the Senate and faculty boards. The union executive also coordinates with local organisations to promote good relationships between the student and the local population, what we call town and gown relations. We take an active part in presenting a positive image of the student body. We also represent your views and support your rights in cooperation with other student unions across the country. In short, we have your welfare and your interests at heart. Section 3 Track 14 Angela, hi, how are you? Good, thanks, Steve. Enjoying this weather. How about you? Well, I'm just starting my final year and I'm getting worried. Ah, exam nerves.、Mm, not yet, but I didn't do very well in my last exams, and if I don't do better this year, I'm not going to get the jobs I want. You did well. What's the key to getting a good degree? Well, where do you think you went wrong? Oh, I just don't think I studied properly. I mean, what did you do in your final year? Work. Okay, but how did you go about it? I think the most useful thing I did was that I planned everything in detail at the beginning of the year. I looked at the targets I had for the summer and worked backwards from there. I made a list of everything that had to be done before the exams from September onwards. Sounds depressing. Well, the thing is that then you know exactly what you need to do and you can make a timetable. I worked out what I was going to do during every week of that year. Did you stick to the plan? Pretty much. It really helped actually because it made sure I covered everything, but it also forced me to be realistic about how much I could do. So I just dropped things when time ran out because otherwise you could just go on forever. Yeah, that sounds like a good move. And I know organisation is one of my weak points. What else? Well, I chose which subjects I was going to do pretty carefully. Don't do 20th century history, for example. It's fascinating, but just too big to do in 10 weeks. So that's essential. But on the other hand, you have to get some enjoyment out of it. So it's a good idea to choose at least some subjects you're really interested in. Track 15. I'd be glad of some ideas for my dissertation, especially about reading. There's just so much that's been written on the subject, and I can't read it all. Well, you need to know what the main authors think, and you have to read three or four of them in detail, but you certainly don't need to read 25 books from start to finish. No, time's short. I need to start writing at the beginning of next month, so that gives me three weeks for research. The best starting point on the subject is Bradley's book, I'd say. It covers all the issues and gives you a really good overview. That's a help. You also need to read Peter Holland's book. It has an interesting new way of looking at things. And if you look at Johnson, that'll give you a solid idea of how people were thinking in the 80s and early 90s, which is essential. Good. I was thinking I'd look at those and Murray. Murray's interesting, but he covers much the same stuff as Johnson in much the same kind of way. I'd read Johnson if I were you. 
What else? Um, Richards has some really unusual ideas. It's hard to know what to make of them, but they can liven up a tired mind. I'd certainly have a look. You could probably get away with reading the last chapter. It's a good summary of his argument. Track 16. Hi, Jim. How's things? All right. How are you, Kimberly? I'm okay. I'm a bit worried about this presentation we've got to do. Next week, yeah. So, what are we going to say? Good question. <laughs> no idea. Suppose we try to plan it out now, okay? Then we'll have more of an idea what we need to do. Okay, yeah. Good move. So, we have to talk about the business we set up as part of our coursework last year. Uh-huh. Suppose we just list some ideas about things we could say. That way we'll be able to choose some headings for the presentation. Okay. Like what? Where do we start? Oh, we've got to give an overview at the start. Uh -huh. What the idea for the business was, how we first got it, why we chose it, that sort of thing. You're right. we got to show them some of the products, too. <laughs> yeah, that'd be fun. They'll enjoy passing them around the room, and we'll get a few laughs. <laughs> right. You know, for me, after we got the basic concept sorted out, the most important thing was working out the money, how we were going to grow the business and sustain sales, all that kind of thing. Don't you think people are going to go to sleep if we start showing them spreadsheets and talking to them through the accounts? Mm. I think we should go easy on that side of things. Give them a couple of figures, no more, and just leave the accounts out. Yeah, a lot of people wouldn't follow them anyway. But we must talk about the marketing side, how we developed the approach to selling that got things up and running. Yeah. Maybe we need to talk about where the startup cash came from. Mm, I think we can leave that out. They can ask if they want to know. You know, it could be useful to role-play a sales conversation. Yeah, if we have time. And then we could finish up with a question-and-answer session. That ought to take up five or ten minutes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not so sure I like the sound of that. We could end up getting asked something really embarrassing. <laughs> Are you sure there's going to be time anyway? Okay, okay. Questions if time allows. Mm. So, uh, do you want to kick off with the overview? Track 17. So, Jim, would you do it all again? What? Set up a business? Mm. Definitely. It's the most fun I've had with coursework ever. Changed my mind about university. Because it wasn't just studying, it was really practical. Didn't you think one of the best things about it all was the excitement? Yeah, right. I never imagined that running a business could be so exhilarating. <laughs> and the other part I thought was absolutely fantastic was actually making a profit. Uh-huh. I couldn't seriously believe we never ran out of money. <laughs> <laughs> in fact, it started flowing in pretty steadily after the first term, didn't it? But uh, I'll tell you what did take me by surprise, and that was the hard work. There wasn't a moment's rest, was there? No, it was exhausting. I had no idea running a business was going to be so time-consuming. Mm. You couldn't do something like that in your evenings and days off and work at a full-time job. No, you couldn't. And in the real world, you'd have to control the accounts more carefully. Mm. I wish I'd attended more of those first-year company accounts lectures. As it was, I had to learn all that stuff from scratch. Really? You mean you'd forgotten it all, or you just never studied any of it? I just didn't go to many lectures, so I didn't learn much at all. And another difference. With real life, you'd have to have a more detailed business plan. I mean, if the bank's going to lend you money to get things off the ground... That's true. The banks need to know you're going to be a fairly small risk before they part with their money. So what do you think, Kimberly? Should we go ahead with a real business next year? Section 4. Track 18. In today's lecture, we're going to take a look at a relatively new professional sector called Construction Site Logistics Management, which involves the organization and supervision of large-scale building contracts on site. First, we'll see why this new profession has evolved, then we'll have a brief glimpse at what a site logistics management team does and the kind of projects it controls. And finally, I'll outline some of the advantages of this kind of management, both for construction companies and individual professionals. In the past, 
20 years ago, say, there was no such thing as construction site logistics management. Construction companies simply competed for projects and, if they were successful, they did the building themselves or formed a consortium to share the work. These days, as I'm sure you're all aware, managing a large building contract is a much more complex process than it was in the past. Nowadays, it involves coordinating a wider range of professionals on a large scale. For instance, an international construction project will use the services of an assortment of legal, financial, commercial and human resource specialists. We should also recognize that, in this day and age, the building industry is more accountable to society than it used to be. For example, on a specific project, a construction company may have to take ecological issues into account and deal sensitively with powerful pressure groups that want to protect our natural surroundings. So, this is the kind of environment in which site logistics management evolved. What exactly do construction site logistics managers do? Well, they're involved in a remarkable range of activities. They may simply supply the equipment needed on the site. Or they might provide the construction workers. Another function could be to manage the whole site. So, they might bring in a complete management team. In some cases, they'll supply and manage everything on the site, including materials, machinery, labour, transport and security services. So, what kind of project will a construction site logistics management team work on? The kind of project involved can vary enormously. It could be anything from a big civil engineering project to constructing a single building. So, the project may involve digging a tunnel through the Alps, constructing a hydroelectric power station complete with dam, or building a new department store. Now I'd like to turn to some of the advantages of logistics management. First, Let's consider the advantages of this type of management for building contractors. Well, by employing a site logistics management team to control certain aspects of the project, contractors can be free to focus on the activities they are more specialised in. Another benefit is that they can cut their costs by employing experts for specific functions as and when they need them rather than employing them on a permanent basis. What are the benefits of this kind of work for the individual professional? For those who enjoy travel and working in an international environment, this kind of work offers an exceptional variety of opportunities. Large-scale construction is, of course, an increasingly international field and, in fact, it's an example of how work in the modern world can flow from one place to another. Today's site logistics manager may spend up to a couple of years working on a major project, hundreds or thousands of miles from home, be it in the north of Scotland, in Siberia or in Romania. Today, for example, there are tremendous opportunities in Central Europe as the infrastructure of the new accession countries is brought up to date. Poland has had a thriving construction sector for more than 10 years now, and the Czech Republic is also developing rapidly. Track 19 Good afternoon. Today we continue our series of talks on career opportunities for graduates in commerce and industry. To begin with, we'll be looking at sectors offering openings to graduates from a wide variety of disciplines. Although retailing is thousands of years old, it is paradoxically one of the fastest moving business sectors, responding quickly to changes in fashion and technology. Looking at retailers today, we can see that they combine a number of different approaches to the customer so that you may find yourself working in a traditional high street store or for an e-tailer 
a retailer who sells on the internet. Now let's turn to how you get into retail. The first thing to say is that there are some obvious graduate entry routes. For instance, a degree in business management could be one, and information technology another. But more than most fields, retail welcomes non-specialists. If you choose retail, you'll find yourself in competition with bright, ambitious managers who went straight into business from school and could already have anything up to six or seven years experience, much of it perhaps in management. Most of them will have started at the bottom as an assistant on the shop floor and this can be a huge advantage because it teaches you the business from the inside out. So retail is an exciting business and one that the alert and ambitious can do well in. The rewards can be very high but it's also a business, as I've already implied, where you need to be fast moving and flexible yourself. Think about the big high street department stores and how they've changed in recent years. A decade ago, they were radically different businesses from today. Long established companies doing very well, the same things they've done for decades, introducing new products here and there, but essentially no different from a generation earlier and making, some of them, quite astonishing profits, over a billion pounds a year in one case. And then, almost overnight, things changed. They faced expert, fast-moving challenges from new, smaller competitors. The verticals, as they became known, such as Gap and Zara. And secondly, the technology changed, almost beyond recognition. Today, those same department stores are no longer the high street giants they were. They are multi-channel retailers, selling through the internet, through designer outlets, through small, specialist shops using their own brand name, perhaps through mail order, and of course, through their high street stores, which now look like those of the verticals. Track 20. Now let's take a few minutes to look at some of the ways in which technology has changed the retail sector in the last decade. A major change is the till system the cash machines in stores. A generation ago, the till was simply a machine for keeping money in and printing receipts. Today, it's part of a vast electronic tracking system which can identify individual products. This pair of jeans or that belt and tell the store's head office when to send more to the store. One of the most recent technological changes has been RFID, radio frequency identification the system which allows the store to track every single item of stock through electronic tags attached to the merchandise. There are various types of tags which can be passive, that is, they don't have a power source, or active, in which case they have a built-in battery. They all contain information about the products they're attached to and can be read by a number of devices. These devices may be built into the till, or they may be the kind you can carry around, a handheld device. They register the information on the tag electronically and pass it to a computer. This computer may be an ordinary PC or a more powerful computer. The computer, in turn, has an Ethernet connection to a network. In this way, it's possible for the store to track stock automatically. So. What are the rewards of a career in retail? And what are some of the possible routes? Speaking Module Part 1 Track 21 Interview 1 Can you tell me your name, please? My name is Chung Li Rong. What shall I call you? Oh, please call me Li. That's the name I use in English. OK. Thanks, Li. And where are you from? From Shanghai, in China. And can I see your identification, please? Of course. Here you are. Track 22. Interview 2. I'd like to talk about what you do. Are you a student? Well, I've been studying recently for this test. But uh, 
No, I work in a care home for elderly people. Do you enjoy that? Uh, it can be frustrating at times, but mostly, yes, very much. It's a huge privilege to be able to help people who are coming to the end of their lives. Uh, some of them have given a lot to other people in many ways, but now they may find some quite simple things quite difficult. It's very rewarding to be able to help them and make their lives easier. Why did you choose that occupation? Oh, actually, I'm a nurse. I've been working in nursing for years, and I hope to do that in the UK. But first I need to do IELTS. In the meantime, I am supporting myself by working as a care assistant. Track 23 Interview 3 What do you like doing in your free time? I have a very busy job. I don't have free time. What do you like doing in your free time? Uh, actually, you know, uh, I played football a lot before, uh, but now I have no time. And uh, What do you like about football? It's good. Uh, I like football because it has many things. It's exciting. Are there any things you don't like about football? Uh, you know... Uh, Are there any things you don't like about football? Uh, I think uh, everything is good. I like everything about football. It uh, relaxes me, you know. Track 24. Interview 4. Can you tell me your name, please? My name Hyang Cheng. What shall I call you? Uh, you can call me John. OK. Thanks, John. And where are you from? I'm from Changsha, the capital of Hunan province in China. Hunan is a very old province with an interesting history. Its name means Lake South, uh, but we have the same name because it's sometimes called Hyang for the Hyangyang River which runs through the province. Hyang has population 63 million and... OK, thank you. Track 25. Interview 5. What do you like doing in your free time? Well, you know, I really don't have much time these days because I have a busy job at the hospital and when I'm not working, I'm looking after the children at home. So it's really true to say that I have almost no free time. If I had some time for myself, I would read more. What do you enjoy about reading? Oh, I love reading. When I was a child, I used to read all the time. The thing is, you can learn so much from reading. You can understand so much about the world and the people in it, and you can learn so much about what's new by reading magazines and newspapers. One of the things I really enjoy is the New Scientist, because it's always full of interesting things about developments in science, and it has some really good odd, quirky things in it. They did a piece recently on 13 things that just don't fit with our current understanding of the universe, for instance. What kind of books do you enjoy reading? Oh, novels. Contemporary novels, especially. But I must admit, I have a weakness for detective stories, and I do miss those. These days, pretty much all the reading I do is for my work, professional journals. Are there any kinds of books you don't like? Absolutely. I loathe science fiction. Why? Well, let's just say my husband reads anything with an alien on the cover, but I prefer reading about real things and real people, or at least realistic, if not real. Track 26. 
Interview 6. What do you like doing in your free time? Well, you know, I like to driving. I have a 4x4 and I like to drive it a lot. Sometimes I drive around the center of the city and watch people to see who is there and what they're looking like and what they are wearing and what they're doing. Who they are with, and、uh, like this. There are、uh, some special places I like to do this because also it is good that people see you. So, also, I like to dress well and wear smart clothes so people will see me and know I am a, a smart person. Sometimes my friends and I. We like to drive on the highway. We have a long highway. It is mostly very straight, and you can drive very, very fast here when it is not too busy. In the morning, people going to work, and in the afternoon, people going home, and the highway very, very busy. But other times, it is quiet, and you can drive fast, especially at night. This is very good. Also, I like to go camping sometimes in my car. And... Part 2, Track 27. I would like to talk about a machine. A machine I have, it is mine. It is a computer. This computer is very special to me. My parents gave it to me. It is a really good computer. Also, it looks really cool. It has a slimline tower, and I have some really powerful loudspeakers. I kind of wanted a、uh, notebook.、Uh, you say notebook or laptop?、Uh, but I need a lot of power sometimes, and if you want a lot of power in a notebook, that's、uh, very, very expensive. So I talked about it with my parents,、uh, what we could afford, and I decided a PC, like、uh, for my desk. Would be better because with this I can do many different things. I like to do many, many things with this computer. I like to go online and I spend a lot of my free time online.、Uh, it's good because you can go in chat rooms and you can talk to friends. Maybe some of these friends are really friends, you know, like. People you know in your studies or in your university, but also other friends who maybe I have never met in my life because they live in、uh, different parts of the world. Like sometimes I play chess with a guy in Russia. <laughs> I mean, like I've never been to Russia and、uh, maybe I'll never go, but I have a friend there and、uh, that's cool. <laughs> but you can do a lot of other games on the internet. Uh, I mean, like、uh, online gaming, and that's really cool. Like, you can be playing in this、uh, environment with different people at the same time, and they can be anywhere, you know?、Uh, sometimes I like to try out new games too, like on、uh, CDs. And I have some friends,、uh, we get a lot of these CDs. And we swap them so you can try a lot of、uh, good programs and games without, like, you know,、uh, need to buy them all. And、uh, you see which one you like. Also,、uh, I like very much to download music, and I have an iPod, so I like to use my computer in this way too. And it's、uh, a bit the same with movies. I like to make video films and I can edit them with my computer. Track 28. Candidate 1. I love Lone Pine. It's near Brisbane in Australia, actually, just outside Brisbane, I think. I visited some friends who live in Brisbane and they suggested I could go there. I got a bus from the city and it took half an hour. It's a big park or something like that. There are many different kinds of animals. They are interesting animals too. I saw so many different kinds. There were koalas and kangaroos 
and I think uh, maybe the other kind, uh, what's that called, a wall, wallabies. Um, also, there were snakes, and I have a picture of me holding a snake. <laughs> I liked the lorikeets best. It made an impression on me, because there are so many kinds of animal I had never seen anywhere before. Track 29. Candidate 2. Actually, I'd like to talk about my favorite place in England, which is York Minster. That's the cathedral in the city of York. I never heard this word, Minster, before I went there. I thought maybe it was some special kind of minister, but I soon found this was wrong. I know about York Minster because I was studying English near there in Harrogate and they told me in the language academy I must visit the Minster in York. So I took the train, which was just half an hour, and then to reach the Minster from the station is easy, only 10 minutes on foot. And I can say this cathedral is really one of the great buildings of Europe. It's a very special piece of architecture. So beautiful, with such fine lines, so tall. I have seen many wonderful buildings and many of the great Gothic cathedrals, and this is absolutely my favorite. So, I walked round this cathedral and enjoyed the arches, the sculptures, and the ceiling especially, until I came to the East End. And here, something quite unexpected for me happened. There is a place uh, just behind the, uh, I can say, the formal part of the cathedral where you can sit. It's very impressing, uh, astonishing. Not so much because of what it looks like, but because of how it makes you feel. There is a space between where you can sit and look at the final east wall, which is only a few meters from you, perhaps three or four. And most of this east wall is in fact windows. Wonderful stained glass windows. So I sat down and I looked up at the windows and slowly something quite unexpected happened to me. There is a kind of quiet, a hush, which slowly comes into you as you sit there, and soon you can feel the peace of the place, and how people have come here for hundreds of years to sit and be silent and peaceful. Thousands and thousands of people for hundreds and hundreds of years. This is something truly special. I have found such a feeling only in a few places, but this is one of those places where just to be there can give you this silence inside. Track 30. Candidate 3. I want to talk about my favorite place. It is Whitby, you know... Uh, this is where I am living now that I am living in UK, having come here by plane from my country. I came here, uh, uh, have come here for my job, so I am working now in Whitby. Whitby is in Yorkshire and it is very fine because, you know, there we are having the sea, of course, <laughs> and at home we are having the sea also. So this is wonderful for me because it is like a little, uh, I mean, like a, a glimpse of home. I have lived there now for three months. I will tell you now why uh, it is my favorite place. Uh, <clears throat> I like this town because, you know, it, it looks very fine, quite uh, romantic. There are many good things you can do, and the, uh, the harbour is so beautiful. Also, the hills next to the harbour, they are so steep. You can climb up many steps to the top, where there is a building, 
uh, you know, church, uh, abbey, it is empty. You know, the walls are broken and now nobody lived there, but it looks like, you know, something from a horror movie or something like that. This is something I never saw before in my life, and I am liking this so much, like I feel this is the real England. <laughs> also because, you know, the people, they are so kind, so very kind. Almost I feel like I am in my home in this place. And it is exciting because here is beginning a new, uh, new part of my life. And so now this is my most favorite. So if I would have the same choice again, you know I will make the same decision. Track 31. Candidate 2. Have you been there again since then? Yes, a number of times. I always make a point to visit this minister every time I am in the north of England. Last year, for example, I was on holiday with my wife and children. We have two children, you know. Uh, one is eight and the other is nine, both girls. And we decided this year we would go camping because the girls are old enough to manage everything you have to do when you go camping. And also it would be a good way for us all to improve our English. So... <laughs> I'd like to talk about something else now. Uh. Track 32. Candidate 3. Have you been there again since then? Yes. Thank you. Track 33. Candidate 1. Have you been to the animal park again since then? No, I haven't had a chance yet. But I love Australia, especially Queensland, and I'm planning to go back and stay with my friends again. I will definitely go there again when I do. Part 3. Track 34. Candidate 1. Do you think it's true that people today generally experience more stress than 50 years ago? Uh, more stress? Yes. Is life today more stressful than 50 years ago? Ah, stressful. Uh, yes, I think today's lifestyle is very stressful. Everywhere today there is too much stress. Uh, stress for students is very bad. In my country, students have to work so hard. Uh, first in the place, uh, at school they must study hard and they must study many, many hours after school. Uh, they must work very hard for exams and there are too many exams. Then university also very stress. And then you must get a job. And this too is very hard for many people because it is very competition for the best jobs. If you don't get the best jobs, you don't have chance for earn the best salary and have good life for yourself and your family. So I think it's hard for young people and uh, too much stress. Track 35. Candidate 2. Do you think it's true that people today generally experience more stress than 50 years ago? That's an interesting question and quite complex. I think it depends where you live. In my country, we have experienced some conflicts, especially in this time you talk about. There is sometimes fighting, not all the time, it comes and it goes, but of course this situation means uncertainty. You do not know what will happen, so it is difficult to plan your life. What studies will you do? Where will you live? How will you build your career? These are not questions you can always think about because you don't know if you and your family and your friends will be safe. This is very stressful. So, in this way, I would have to answer that life is more stressful today. But I have said already, this depends on where you live. In many countries today, people talk about stress and they mean that they must work hard 
but their lives are also very comfortable because they have all things they need and they have many luxuries too. Probably the life of their parents and grandparents was not so comfortable. Track 36. Candidate 3. How have communications changed in your lifetime? Communications? Yes, the ways that people communicate with each other. Uh, I'm sorry, could you explain more, please? People sometimes say there has been a revolution in communications. They mean things like the internet. Ah, thank you. Uh, I think there has been very big change in this area. Uh, maybe the most obvious change now the mobile phone. My uncle, he studied in England 30 years ago. In that time, he was very lonely because he was far from our family and everything here very strange for him. He told me it was hard for him sometimes to talk on the phone with our family and friends, and sometimes he had to wait a long time on the phone to make his call to our country, because in that time it was not possible just to call right away to another country if it was far away. This was very difficult for him because he stayed here a few years. First he studied English language and then he went to university here. For me it is very different. I have my mobile. If I want to talk with my father, my mother, my brothers and sisters, my friends, I can do this and there is no delay, just instant. Also, of course, we send email, so it is not difficult and very cheap, even free. Every day I can email my friends and it doesn't matter where we are. Sometimes my friends are in different countries, so I think this is very good. A uh, big change and much better than before. Practice Test Section 1 Track 37 Good morning. Morning. Can I help you? Well, I'd like to join the library, please. And there's a specific book I need as well. OK, that's fine. Now, I'll have to put all your details into the system. Just a minute. Ah, could I have your name, please? It's Mahmoud Al-Nazri. Is that M-A-H-M-U-D? Uh, no, it is O-U-D. Sorry. And could you spell your surname, please? A-L-N-A-Z-R-I. And what's the address? It's 195 Hills Road. 195 Hills Road. And do you know the postcode? I'm sorry, I don't. Never mind. Do you have a phone number? Yeah, it's uh, 07942-116470. Now... I'm putting you down for individual student membership. That means your membership is free, but there are some services you'll have to pay for. What kind of services? Oh, if you want to request a book we haven't got on the shelves and we have to order it from storage. Or if you want to borrow CDs or DVDs. I see. Now, did you say there's a book you wanted to see this morning? I can tell you how to find it. Uh, yes, thanks. I've got the details written down here. Let me see. Ah, oh, dear. Listening skills for students. What is it? Oh, I'm afraid we'll have to request it from storage. I can input the details here and you'll have to pay a fee. How much is that? It's a dollar fifty per book. OK. Well, could you order it for me, please? Yeah, of course. Right. Now, you can come back this afternoon and it should be here. What time? Oh, say half past two to be safe. Uh, and you'll need this reference number. Uh, do you want to jot this down? OK. It's RBC 096109. Got that? Give it to the librarian when you come back. Right, thanks. So I need to come back here for about 2.30? That's right. It might be here before that, but 2.30 should be safe. Is there anywhere around here I could get something to eat while I'm waiting? Of course. There's a canteen here in the library. 
Good. Which way is that, please? Go along the corridor just here, past the lecturer's reading room, and carry on down to the very end. That's the main reading room. Go in and turn right. The canteen's just through the door halfway down the room. You'll see the sign. Thanks. That's great. Oh, and I need to use a computer as well. Where can I do that? Well, there are PCs all over the building, but the main computer suite is right next to the canteen, in fact. Or there's another door into it from the main entrance, just over there on the left. And uh, the toilets? The toilets are opposite the lecturer's reading room, second on your left as you go down the corridor. Thanks very much. Section 2. Track 38. Good morning. What I'd like to do in this first session is to give you some ideas about how you can settle in, both in the city and the university. Every year we support a few hundred students from other countries, and today we want to give you the benefit of their experiences. For example, can you guess what the most common overall worry is for international students during their time here? Studying in English, you might think. Or money worries. But in fact, the majority say that making friends is their biggest concern. You'll probably find, uh, last year's intake of foreign students certainly did, that your biggest problem in week one isn't making friends, or English, or money, but simply understanding what is going on. It can be a confusing time. By the end of the year, though, for most of last year's international students, academic worries had replaced social and other concerns as the number one issue. I'll come on to make some detailed suggestions in a few minutes, but in the meantime, let me just say I think your main priority this week should be to meet people. Also important, of course, is to find out about living here, where things are, where to go at particular times, where the various facilities are, and so on. And you need to find out something about the town too. Perhaps the best advice I can give you about that is to get a bike. Cycling is usually the easiest way around the place. It's quicker than walking and cheaper than the bus. And uh, probably more reliable too. There's a huge number of events this week. Really more than you can possibly get to, and part of the fun is choosing. But there are certain things that I think you must make sure you get to. These suggestions are based on comments made by students in previous years, by the way. The Language Centre has a seminar on Tuesday to show you the kind of support they can give you with the English language. They offer a great deal more than I could describe at the moment. But one thing I would suggest right now is they have an excellent computer laboratory at the Language Centre and it's a good idea to use it as much as possible in your spare time, especially during the first term. The second must-see session is a lecture called Managing Your Money. This has all kinds of helpful suggestions about your finances, but the main one I'd like to underline now is how important it is for you to open a bank account at once. The lecture, by the way, is provided by Smith's Bank, but you could, of course, use any of the banks in town. There's not much difference between them. Finally, there are more than 50 university clubs and societies, and joining one or two is an excellent way to meet people and make friends. They have informal meetings going on all week. You can see the details on the handout. What I'd like to say about these is choose something that interests you and go along. Finally, we have a very informative student newsletter. You should all have a copy in your orientation pack. It's a good idea to check it for details of club events. Section 3. Track 39. Hello, Dr. Poole. I'm glad you're in. Have you got a few minutes, please? Uh, sure, Richard. Come on in. What can I do for you? Well, I'm really confused at the moment, and I was wondering if we could talk about my Chinese language. What, the lectures or the reading or what? No, I feel okay with that side of things. 
What's bothering me is really how to study the language itself. Ah,、uh, the private study aspect. That's right. You see, I've studied Spanish and French and was able to use them quite a lot on holiday, and I met a lot of people I could practice with. But this is completely different. I have no idea where to start and no one I can practice with. I don't even know if I've got the right books. Well, the books on the reading list are fine. You can keep working with those. Let's work out a study plan and get your priorities clear. And my pronunciation is just terrible, and I don't know how to improve it. Hmm. Remember, we're dealing with a language that's really different from English, French, or Spanish, so you probably need to take a different focus. I see pronunciation less as something to do a lot of intensive work on, and more as something that'll develop with practice and experience. <laughs> don't lose sleep over it at this stage. I sometimes think I should just drop the course and go to China. Then maybe I could come back and study more. Would I be able to start the course again next year? Well, you might, although I can't guarantee that. But I think you'll get much more benefit from a stay in China next year. I think you should concentrate on learning more of the basics first. You mean grammar? Yes, I think your priority for now should be to get really familiar with the grammar. Focus your private study on the language structures at the moment. The key is the written language, so you should dedicate as much time as you can to studying the way the language is written. Get plenty of practice, and then next semester you can start building up your vocabulary more. So you don't think I should drop out of the course? Not at all. I think the problems you're having are pretty normal ones, especially for someone who's not really used to learning a language in its written form. I think what you need to do most is improve your motivation. Look for opportunities to get into the language. You want to go to China, so make that a target, a, a reason for improving. There's a scholarship competition for students who want to visit China. So make an application, and think about what there is here in the local environment that you can use. There are plenty of Chinese students around. You can probably arrange some exchange classes with one of them. You speak English with them. They help you with writing basic Chinese sentences. Have you joined the China Society? Yes, but I haven't been to any meetings yet. We'll use them. It's a chance to hear people speaking and to see Chinese films. I'll do that. At this stage, you won't understand everything, and you can say very little. But you're laying foundations. Chinese is really different, so work on developing your mental flexibility. Read simple books. Read popular magazines. Start getting familiar with the way sentences are organized. What about speaking? Well, that will really come later when you know more. But what you can do now is lots of listening. It'll pay off later. Watch TV. Go to those meetings. You can just sit and listen and join in when you're ready. Maybe next year. Don't worry if you can't say anything. You won't be the only one. Section four, track forty. In today's lecture, we take a look at the background to the recent interest in spas, the natural water springs, and the towns built on those springs, where people go to bathe and drink the waters. We tend to assume that treatment with water. Often in luxurious surroundings, is a modern phenomenon. Nothing could be further from the truth. The idea of immersing yourself in water for the sake of better health, whether of mind, body, or spirit, is very old, perhaps as old as humanity. In Finland, hot springs were exploited three thousand years ago for saunas. The Japanese used hot springs too. It's reported that the first one opened at Izumo. In 737 BC, it's interesting to note that leisure complexes developed here, although some hundreds of years afterwards. We know from writers, including Homer, that the ancient Greeks had a number of forms of social bathing as early as 500 BC, as did the Babylonians and later the Romans. The bathhouse is, of course, Often cited as one of the Roman Empire's lasting contributions to civilization in the countries they ruled, although they may not have been the first to use natural waters in this way. The first large-scale public baths were constructed in 25 BC. We like to think that leisure centers are a modern idea. In fact, the Romans certainly had the same concept 2,000 years ago, and the bathhouses. Evolved into complexes which included restaurants, for example, as well as other forms of entertainment, a concept which, as we know, 
the Japanese had created previously. The early history of spas in Britain is not entirely clear. Legend has it that King Lear's father, Blalud, was cured of leprosy by the hot mud at Bath in 863 BC and that he founded the town of Bath as a result. Certainly, the Romans developed an important spa centre there. This is hardly surprising, given that it is the only place in Britain where springs provide a continuous supply of hot water at about 50 degrees Celsius. Public baths seem to have fallen into disuse after the Romans left, but came into favour again during the 18th century when, right across Europe, they were considered the height of fashion, with visitors flocking to centres such as Baden-Baden in Germany, Evian-les-Bains in France, Saint-Moritz in Switzerland, and of course Bath, Buxton and Harrogate in Britain, often on the advice of their doctors. Inherent in all this is the assumption that bathing is good for the health, and that the waters may have medicinal value, as in the story about Blalud. Today, there is a general feeling that spa treatments are calming for the mind and body. However, there is less consensus about the medicinal value of spa waters. 250 years ago, doctors recommended taking the waters for many medicinal purposes. It was regarded as a tonic to improve the patient's general well-being. Many people today would agree that bathing often has such effects. Spa treatment centres and their proponents claim much more. Bathing in spa waters with a high sulphur content, they say, helps with skin conditions. And very highly carbonated salt waters, such as those at Baden-Baden and Harrogate, have long been thought to help with rheumatism and other conditions. That said, the bathing water used at many spa treatment centres is not, in fact, spa water, but simply water from the town's mains water supply. Similar claims are made for drinking spa waters. Some waters, because of their chemical composition, are claimed to clean and improve the general condition of the skin, and most are said to have a beneficial effect on the digestion, more so than ordinary water. If we accept that this may once have been true before the development of modern medicine, before doctors had other means of removing parasites from the body, for example, then what effects do today's much higher pollution levels have on groundwater? Finally, there is a third field to consider, bottled water. Many people on Earth have no clean water for drinking, washing or cooking, yet worldwide bottled water is a multi-billion dollar industry. The cost of bottled water in developed countries may be as much as 10,000 times the cost of water from the tap. But is bottled water any healthier than the tap water which costs so much less? As you can see, there are many questions to be answered, and we have only begun to look at the political aspects of water, a resource which will become more and more important and less and less easy to find, in fact, one of the world's biggest political issues, as the century goes on. And this is where we will pick up in our next lecture, looking at water as a geopolitical resource. IELTS Graduation Study Skills by Charlie Martineau and Jane Short Published by Macmillan Education A division of Macmillan Publishers Limited Copyright Macmillan Publishers Limited 2007